Good evening. I'm John Siegenthaler. Thank you for joining us for Perspectives, Health Care in Middle Tennessee. Now, there's no question that the debate over health care is the dominant public policy issue today. We've assembled a panel of local experts to discuss the national issues, consider how they could affect the people of Middle Tennessee. With us tonight is Dr. Reginald Coopwood. He's the CEO of the Metro Hospital Authority. The Hospital Authority oversees the administration of Nashville General Hospital at Meharry, Bordeaux Long-Term Care, and the Knowles Assisted Living <coughs> Facility. Also joining us is Congressman Jim Cooper, representing the 5th Congressional District of Tennessee. Congressman Cooper has long been an active participant in the health care policy debate. And finally, we're joined by Dr. John Surgeon. Dr. Surgeon is Vice Chair for Education and the Residency Program Director in the Department of Medicine at Vanderbilt University. Also, he's a frequent contributor uh, with a medical column to the Tennessean. Uh, welcome to all three of you. you. It's great to have you here. You. We've just seen uh, a compelling 90-minute program in which um, at the outset, we viewed a family um, in which a mother, uh, because of a, of a previous illness, was denied insurance, a child who needs an operation, a father who has a job um, but no health coverage, uh, a family in which the parents have been told, if you want to get health care, get a divorce. Um, I think about our own community. Um, I'm not sure we'd find one family with that many uh, problems, but my guess is that there are many problems, many families with some of these problems. Just how serious is this problem? Do we know? How many people are affected? There are tens of thousands of Nashvillians who lack health insurance, and you can never tell when an illness or injury will strike. So we hope that there are no Nashvillians in the dire circumstances of that family, but the probability is that there are. I've seen I've seen every one of those examples. Uh, I don't know that I've seen them all in the same family, but I've seen p families who who were split apart because uh, by being divorced, the the mother and child could get insurance, and the father would be out of the family. I've certainly seen all the other uh, examples, pre-existing conditions, and so forth. And there's so many people in our community who are working or contributing to society and trying to do the right thing, but aren't able to um, get health care and have to get into these situations and have these type of recommendations that are really sad and, and detrimental to the family structure in order to try to get health care. Nashville General at Meharry, uh, without question, um, has the challenge of dealing, I think, with most of the indigent uh, ill in the community. Um, how difficult is that challenge to me? It's, it's difficult. Um, Nashville General Hospital serves as a um, safety net hospital for um, Middle Tennessee for Nashville and Davidson County. Um, we, we share that safety net responsibility with Vanderbilt because they have the trauma center as well. Both of those, um, both of these institutions, by taking care of the burden of the uninsured, um, sometimes make it difficult, especially for us, because 70% of our patients are either uninsured or underinsured with a Medicaid product. It's a difficult um, an expensive proposition to provide quality health care to individuals in those categories. And Nashville General is no different than all the public hospitals across this country who serve as a safety net for their communities. John, uh, John Surgeon, let's talk a little bit about uh, other hospitals. Um, we've heard it said over and over that if um, one of the private hospitals or one of the other hospitals takes uh, a a person who can't pay. Um, the cost of that is spread among other patients and that that's one of the factors that drives up the cost. How accurate is that assessment? Well, it's, it's, very, it's very true. I think the, uh, the, there's absolutely no way that a hospital can stay afloat uh, without uh, compensating for the, for the care of people who can't pay, either because, as Rachel points out, under insurance, which a lot of our patients have, or no insurance. Um, so there's a lot of cost shifting going on, and it's uh, adding to the cost that every employer has to pay for his, his or her employees. Congressman, uh, when we talk about uh, reform, uh, two questions come to mind um, to me. One is, are we talking about reforming the way we administer health care programs, or are we talking about how we pay for health care programs? <coughs> 
That's a great question, John. Health reform really should involve both aspects, both the payment and the delivery. But it's tended to be easier to focus on the insurance side of things, the payment side of things. Uh, the reason is that it's very difficult to change doctor practices. You know, doctors are a profession. Uh, they are largely self-regulating. It's very difficult to get a doctor to change his or her ways. But on the insurance company side, there's broad national consensus that the insurance companies have not been behaving the right way. No American wants to be turned down due to a pre-existing condition. You can't help it if you've been sick or injured in most cases. And no one wants to be dropped from a policy. So I think there's broad national consensus on reforming the payment system. And I hope we can do some things on the delivery side as well. We've had now um, a number of bills introduced in Congress, at least three in your house. Mm -hmm. Um, and one in the other house with a number of um, proposals to improve Senator Balkus' bill or to change or alter or maybe harm Senator Balkus' bill. Um, where are we? What's going to come out of this? I mean, I, people all over Middle Tennessee are, are wondering, uh, is there going to be reform? Is there going to be a bill? Uh, well, people are wondering and they're praying, too, because so many families are stressed out by this situation. We'll know in about two months' time, probably before Christmas, whether there will be a bill. I think there will be a bill, but we still have a lot of work to do. So far, there are four or five congressional bills. They're very long. They're very confusing. What really matters is President Obama's opinion, because he's stepped into the debate and is leading the debate now, and I'm thankful for that, because he has stressed, for example, that health reform not add a penny or a dime to the deficit. That's good. He wants it to cover all Americans. And I hope that the congressional bills will live up to his high standards. We've got a lot of work to do, though, to get them there. One of the key issues that I'm sure every Middle Tennessean has, I mean, we've all heard the word public option, public option, public option. I'm not sure that that's, that that's the, the best way to explain what the issue is about. Um, but, uh, Dr. Surgeon, I notice that a majority of doctors favor a public option, uh, which that number surprised me. Um, how do you feel about it? Well, I, I, I agree with that. I think that uh, despite what Senator Coburn is that mm -hmm. Senator Coburn had to say. Um, in the program just a few moments ago. In the program a few minutes ago. The, uh, most doctors spend a lot of their time, I spend a lot of my time today, in fact, dealing with trying to help people get through the system. Even people with insurance often find that their insurance won't cover certain drugs, won't cover certain procedures and so forth. Uh, and I think doctors are tired of that. I also, despite what Senator Coburn said, uh, know that Medicare, in fact, is the most efficient uh, payer in the country. Uh, about 96 cents on every dollar that Medicare gets actually buys health care, which is a lot more than the private insurance companies. The hassle factor that the doctors have to go through to deal with this myriad of, of uh, plans drives a lot of people crazy. So I think you put all that together, both for the patients and the doctors, a lot of doctors are deciding that at least a public option, if not a single payer system, would be the best way to go. And do you agree with that? Or are you one of the doctors who dissents from that? No, I, I agree with it. Um, I agree with it in principle because of what it potentially will do with bringing down some of the cost of, of um, insurance premiums and that to help in both. As the president has described it, it is, it is an option to create competition Correct. for the insurance industry. And I think that's valuable and, and, and that needs, they need to be brought into having some realization of, of what they're doing to industry and the amount of dollars that are spent um, for employers to cover health care of their employees is phenomenal. And I think they, that the public option would help that considerably. Uh, Congressman, in the last few days, uh, people have talked about uh, uh, Senator Olympia Snow's trigger mm -hmm. as, a, as an alternative to a public option. Uh, what are we likely okay. to get? Well, John, we'll know the answer to this important question probably as soon as tomorrow. In the Senate Finance Committee, they'll be voting on the Schumer public option amendment. That's one that I support because it's a public option and a level playing field. It would not put the private companies out of business, but it would give them new competition. And there are many states, and Tennessee is one of them too, where the Blue Cross plan has such a dominant position, 60 to 80 percent market share, that they kind of need some competition. And the private sector simply hasn't been able to deliver it. So when the private sector fails, then it's an opportunity for the government to offer people more choice, because that's what people want, so that they can pick their doctor in their hospital. That's the bottom line. And um, how, how, in a, how would this affect 
an individual uh, who comes to your hospital, uh, Doc Cooper, an individual comes to your hospital and uh, can't pay. Uh, now uh, you have to take them. Correct. And you want to take them. Correct. It's your job to take them. <laughs> That's why we're um, there. <laughs> but many other hospitals simply don't want them because it's going to drive up the cost for other patients. And I'm sure that the doctors are feel about it the same way a John Surgeon feels about it. It's 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 beyond taking care of health care. You're taking care of, of people's paperwork in order to solve a problem. Um, the paperwork at your place must be a mountain. <laughs> It is, um, and, and it, it, it drives the amount of things and hurdles that we have to do to try to either try to find out if they're um, available coverage with the current Medicaid system to, you know, the, the thing that is, is misunderstood when they come to our facility, we provide them high quality care. There's a cost there that's really paid for by the citizens of Davidson County with their property tax. So it's not free care. It is dollars that we receive from the city to help pay for um, that safety net in our community. Given the opportunity with people to get insurance, we'd be able to reduce the burden off of the citizens of this county, still provide high quality care for those individuals who now present with insurance um, of, of different levels. I think it surprised people, uh, Dr. Serger, to find out that there are so many doctors at Vanderbilt and other hospitals who really favor this public option, favor creating the competition. How, do, how will that make your job specifically easier? Well, I think most doctors want to practice medicine and want to take care of their patients. Uh, they don't want to fool with uh, all the forms and <laughs> hassle that we have to fool with. We, we have, uh, with all due respect, I think we probably have more people doing uh, back-end stuff at Vanderbilt because of all the insurance. Reginald doesn't have nearly as many <laughs> insured patients as we do. And we have hundreds of people at Vanderbilt doing nothing but dealing with insurance companies. Uh, and all that cost adds to the premiums that all of us have to pay. So I think a lot of doctors are, are saying it's time to, ch to fundamentally change the way we pay for health care in this country. Let me ask you, Congressman, um, constituent services is something you're famous for. Yeah, uh, you yeah, take you. care of people's individual needs. How much of the volume of your office's constituent services deal with the issue of health care? It's probably at least half because um, so many people are disabled and they want to get Social Security disability payments or something like that. So many people are permanently disabled and even at a young age you can qualify for Medicare if you're young but permanently disabled. Uh, but so often it's a, a difficult process because they're you know, um, terribly sick already. They've gone through a lot of doctor bills. Sometimes they've faced bankruptcy as a result. Then they face this ju judicial and government red tape which drives them crazy. So we need to make a better system. We're the greatest country in the history of the world. Surely we can have a healthcare system that lives <laughs> up to our greatness. And we have such marvelous resources here in Nashville, but sometimes we haven't gotten the results because in Nashville, sadly, people aren't living longer. They're not living healthier. We can and should do better because we have magnificent institutions here, but we're not quite getting that to the grassroots level yet. What do you say to people who question whether members of Congress uh, are really competent to deal <laughs> with uh, the details of health care, with medical care. I mean, what do you know uh, that, uh, that a doctor wouldn't be better able to resolve? Well, I don't know more than a doctor. <laughs> I would like it for the medical system to figure it out itself and then just tell Congress what the answer is. But so often there are warring parties here and they come to Congress to resolve the dispute. I focused on health care issues. There's many of my colleagues who focused on other things. Um, but health care issues are the number one domestic issue, as you say. And especially during this crucial fall period, people are waiting with bated breath to see whether Congress and the White House can produce on this long sought dream of getting everybody affordable coverage. And that's the key affordability. Because there's no such thing as a free lunch, there's no such thing as a free doctor. It's got to be paid for somehow. And can we get a system? that helps everybody live up to their full God-given potential by being healthy. That shouldn't be too hard, but right now we're failing at that because with obesity, with diabetes, with these other epidemics that are running rampant, we're not living up to our potential. I, I, was, I, was, uh, I, I was a little bit surprised that obesity, uh, particularly among children, 
played such a dominant part in the program this evening. Mm -hmm. um, is it an overstatement, or how serious is it? Well, it's tremendously serious. Uh, the estimates are that one out of every three children born today will be diabetic. And uh, the impact of that on our health care system and on our society with the number of people who can't work and so forth in the 30s and 40s is going to be huge. It's a major problem. It, it is the leading health care epidemic we're facing. And, uh, and in, um, in, in listening to uh, that program, we heard again and again, the people who are least able to pay um, somehow are most susceptible to obesity. Correct. Um, talk about why that's the case. Well, a lot of it's poor choices of um, healthy opportunities in their communities, whether it's um, healthy food in the grocery stores and in lower socioeconomic um, areas of any city, um, failure to have adequate and safe um, parks and walkways in those areas that does not promote um, healthy lifestyles. Um, as well as it, it has not been an emphasis in our school system over the over the last couple of years, you know when you when you look at the amount of um, childhood obesity, and 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 Congress is trying to and you listen to President Obama look speaking to how expensive this will be if we do nothing, I don't really think they bring in those right. unknown costs of of one in every three ch children that will have diabetes and the complications of dialysis and loss of vision and amputation and all that. I doubt if those numbers are in that calculation of that curve that's going to be out of hand if we do nothing. People use the term food deserts to talk about areas of cities that have literally no grocery stores that offer, that have uh, uh, good, good supplies. Uh, and we have those in Nashville, in North, North Nashville, parts of East Nashville, where to get to a good grocery store, uh, the, not, not just a corner market. Uh, is a huge challenge for these people. And I guess education must play yeah. something of a role in all that. And personal responsibility is also a factor too because there are some things that people could do to walk more, to get more access, and to make wise choices. So it's a balance. Yeah. Talked a little bit, John, uh, John <laughs> Surgeon, about this uh, business of walking. <laughs> well, I, I, I know you have a device in your pocket and I, I, don't, I, I don't know whether the camera can pick it up, but let's give them an opportunity because... I, I didn't show John this, um, I didn't mean to do this, but yeah, I carry this pedometer that tells, tells me how many steps I've taken. Today I've taken 10,047 steps so far. Uh, uh -huh. Yesterday I was uh, 10,000 a little bit under 10,000. But anyway, I, I, it, is a, it is a pretty useful little tool. It costs $25. And uh, if you can walk 10,000 steps a day, you're burning up a few hundred calories. And uh, it's kind of a target I've set for myself. Mm -hmm. We all need to do more. <laughs> <laughs> we all need to do more. We all need to do tell you, more. in my advanced years, I know it so well. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about who is most affected. Uh, the numbers of Hispanics in this country, and of course uh, there are some undocumented, uh, or as, uh, as some commentators would say, illegals. Um, but the numbers of, uh, of minorities who are denied health care uh, is phenomenal. And mm -hmm. that is more than anything else, I think, a political issue. Um, how are, how are members of Congress dealing with it? Well, there are huge health care disparities in our country, uh, racially and ethnically, but there's also a huge regional disparity. The South, in general, is not as healthy as other parts of the country. Now, you can't just blame fried chicken for that, because we all love fried <laughs> foods. But there are diet and exercise habits that people have gotten into. Tennessee is the most over-medicated state of all states. We're the most uh, heavily medicated with a very powerful drug called OxyContin. There's some things we could be doing ourselves to limit our problems, but so far we haven't acted uh, to do that. Uh, if I could just put in a plug, I'm happy to say that the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance is, is probably doing the best study on health care disparities in the country right now, looking at, uh, at why different groups don't do as well as others. I sort of have a sense that uh, the deadlines uh, that President Obama has set uh, in some minds, uh, won't bring about change quick enough. Uh, do you have a sense of that? Well, 
you know, I think there's a sense of urgency because once you say, okay, well, let's take our time and let's take three or four years to do it, what will happen is it'll die out like it's done multiple times. I, I think the, the advantage of, of having the urgency is to be able to get it done. Um, our, our hope and desire of our, of our great legislators in Washington will, in that urgency, also take the time to make sure that we do the right thing because there's nothing worse than hurrying and doing the wrong thing. So I think with what President Obama has outlined, if we can, can construct that bill in such a way that it mat matches those um, requirements, I think we'll, we'll put something out there that will really ultimately make a difference in this country and the health of this country. And do you have a sense of that, uh, uh, John? Yeah, or? I agree. I think there's a sense of urgency just because the feeling is that if we don't do it pretty soon, it'll be another 10 years or more before we get around to it. And I don't think this country can afford the, to continue for 10 more years what we've been doing. But I'm not sure Congress feels that sense of urgency, mm -hmm. although certainly, uh, as your uh, constituents are letting you know, they feel it. Well, just our nation's financial situation will require that we address this problem, so we won't be able to ignore it for 10 more years because the cost of Medicare and Medicaid, these programs are exploding and we have to get them on an affordable basis. Also remember, not all governments at the federal level, uh, state and local government matters too. New York City was able to ban trans fats. Why can't we do that here in Nashville? Uh, there are other things, health steps we could be taking. As the earlier program demonstrated, if we just stopped smoking, started exercising, had better food choices, we could do more than any doctor and hospital in the world to improve our health. But those actions take self-discipline, they take willpower, <laughs> And those are things that sometimes are in short supply. <laughs> and I would think from the earliest uh, years, uh, it must become part of an educational process. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we saw um, on, the, on the national program a few moments ago how there are some schools and how there are some school districts. Uh, we heard Dr. Batchelor from Los Angeles talking about how her program is beginning to make a difference. My, my son just complained to me the other day that he can't get French fries or chips. He has to get corn with his sandwich at, at his high school. All right. And uh, Williamson County has made a decision to, to ban all unhealthy foods. And, and he's not that happy, but it's the right thing to do. How about sodas and things like they, that? They banned all of that. Banned all that? That's interesting. That's pretty progressive. That is, that is, right? That's a, that, is a, that is a that is a level of reform that Congress has absolutely no. Ability we wouldn't be to brave enough to do that. No, that's not. Um, it's a very serious issue, though. I mean, I, I, th I think when you, when you uh, listen to those stories that we heard tonight and you listen to people who are caught in this trap and they've got no way out uh, and, you, and, you, and, and you realize, well, uh, as, Senator, as the Senator, <laughs> as the sen senator said, uh, well, you can find an emotional story. <laughs> anywhere. The problem is there are emotional stories almost everywhere. everywhere. And, um, and there, the problem also is that there is, as of now, no answer at all right. for most of those stories. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to tell all of my patients with stories like that to call Senator Coburn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it might be helpful. Uh, um, that it sounds to me as if uh, Congressman Cooper uh, could probably give him a few lessons <laughs> on, his, on his own. Um, seriously, where is this going? Congressman, well, how, and what's, what are the chances that this year we're going to have a, a mm -hmm. health care reform bill uh, that makes sense and solves at least some of the major problems? Well, former Senator Tom Daschle was in Nashville this week, and when asked to make a prediction, he said it was about a 50-50 chance. I think it's a little bit better than that. I think that the Congress realizes the gravity of the problem and the urgency. I also think that the public is able to be involved more in the debate with the Internet and with talk radio and TV and things like that because they definitely want to be informed. And I think we should have a plan that works for most everybody, whether you're Democrat, Republican, or Independent. So those are the goals. And you know, deadlines are very creative force. I don't need to tell a journalist that. But <laughs> they get the job done now. It shouldn't be a silly deadline, but we should work as hard as we possibly can to finally solve this problem. And I think we can do it before Christmas time. So I'm excited. I'm encouraged. I think this is a very doable thing. 
If we uh, were to um, ask each of you, what, in your judgment, could people on the other side of that television screen do to help this move forward, to help Congress understand the urgency, what would you say? I would say for those who understand the need for change to help get that message to their um, legislatures, um, congressmen and senators um, through the noise. I mean, the noise is so loud and it's trying to drown out those real stories and those real issues. And I think communicating with um, your congressman, your senator, I think is so important. John? I agree completely. That, that's exactly what I would say. I think the, I would also add, don't watch talk radio, uh, don't listen to talk radio and don't watch most of the uh, talk TV shows because they, they really are trying to just drown out the meaning of any of these bills by just lots of background noise and sound bites and meaningless uh, phrases like death panels, for example. Well, Dr. Surgeon's right, uh, Congressman. Uh, I'm sure you've been uh, attacked because you haven't listened to the stories about death panels and, uh, and the scare tactics that have been used by many people who are in opposition to any sort of reform. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings, uh, but regardless of where people are in the debate, I just want them to focus on the facts, and if we do that, we can get through this, and we can have a good solution that most all Americans think is a good solution. You don't need to hear from uh, your well, we constituents. We hear from about 4,000 a day. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that high? It's incredible because health care, unlike any other issue, touches every life, every man, woman, and child here. And it's so vital. It's so important. And I'm glad to hear from folks. So we're trying to craft a solution that helps everybody. And my favorite would be this. I want everybody to have health insurance just like I've got, just like a congressman, just like a federal employee. And that's a very good system for shopping for health benefits. It works really well. It's worked for 30 or 40 years. So why don't we share the system with the whole public? I think that's the best way to do it. I, what do you say to people who say, I just don't want to lose my Medicare? <laughs> well, these reforms are not going to hurt Medicare at all. They don't need to worry about that. My mother just turned 90 this spring. She very much cares about her Medicare, as so many people do. And it's actually the most popular health care program in America. Our efforts are to keep Medicare strong. Most of the health reform that people are talking about are for the under 65 population, the folks who haven't retired yet, who are really, depending on their business, may or may not have health benefits next month or next year, even if they've got a good plan today. It may turn out to be unaffordable in just a very short period of time, or they may develop a health condition that prevents them from keeping coverage. So we've got to fix this system. And whether, whether that's the case or, um, or whether there's another physical problem, uh, the cost is going to continue to rise, and Costs. the result of that is that your co-payments co are going to go up, your it's insurance payments are going to go up, you have to be really rich today to be really confident you can afford health care. So health care is not only breaking family budgets, it's breaking the national budget. And that's where we need to get more value for our money. It's okay if you spend more money and you're getting value if you're living longer or healthier. But if you're not doing that, you're not getting value. And can we solve this problem without breaking the bank, as so many people say? I believe we can, because there's still some money to be saved within the system that would offset some of the cost of what, what's being proposed. John? If you look at just Medicare alone, the, 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 there's huge disparity around the country between how much is spent per Medicare beneficiary from, say, Miami to Minneapolis, uh, with absolutely no evidence that it does any good to spend more. As a matter of fact, it's pretty strong evidence that the people in Minneapolis are better off than the people in Miami, despite the fact that we spend more. We, there are a lot of things we can do to not and not break the bank. And what we're interested in is in making it better for the people in Davidson County in Middle Tennessee. Thank you all for joining me. We've run out of time. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us and to thank you for watching. For Nashville Public Television, I'm John Siegenthaler.